You ever found yourself stuck in a room with people you couldn't stand, but you had no choice but to just grin and bear it? Well, the two leaders of the band in today's episode know that feeling all too well. And you know what? They captured that awkward vibe and they turned it into a song that unexpectedly became a massive international hit. Now, the funny thing is, they never thought the single would take off. They wrote it as a complete joke. Now, we hear this all the time, but this one was just a total parody. In fact, the singer mimicked a legend's vocal for a laugh. Somebody who was a legendary singer at the time, it was a throwaway gag. The front man had even left the band to go solo, but then suddenly the song blew up. And this singer's impersonation of a legend was so good that people thought it was the actual legend on the song. The record label came begging for the lead singer to return, and he did, but by then it was too late. At the core, this is a story of two lifelong friends who built something special from their shared love of music. Along the way, though, there were setbacks, lawsuits, breakups, and unexpected triumphs for two guys who hated the spotlight. We'll take you in, in the middle of the action next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember trying to blow the biggest bubble with Hubba Bubba back in the day, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below, click the red button, and click the notification bell so you always know when our features come out. Oh, man, Hubba Bubba. I don't even know if they have that anymore. Also, check us out on Patreon for more content and our merch below. You know, the story of the group Steelers' Will is wrapped in contradiction. It's almost like a rock and roll riddle. At the center of it were two unlikely stars, Joe Egan and Jerry Rafferty. Were they talented? Absolutely. Everybody knows Jerry's solo smash Baker Street, right? As musicians and songwriters, they had a gift that could not be denied. But for all their skill, there was one thing that held them back, themselves. Steeler's Will was officially a band for less than three years. Now their shining glory was a catchy ditty that shocked the hell out of Joe and Jerry when it became an international smash. And we've all sung along to it. A song called Stuck in the Middle with You going back to 1973. But the song was not supposed to be a hit. I don't even know if it was supposed to be released. Joe and Jerry were haunted by stage fright. So much so that the idea of touring felt more like a nightmare than a dream come true. They, they just dreaded the spotlight, shying away from the very thing that could have propelled them to great fame and fortune. Now, despite the brilliance of their music, their reluctance to embrace the rock star life kept them from soaring as high as they might have soared. Joe Egan and Jerry Rafferty's trek began on the quaint streets of Paisley in west central lowlands of Scotland. From the start, it was clear that they shared a natural passion for music, and that bond would eventually solidify the core Steelers will. Now, as he came of age, Joe Egan wanted to be a footballer. But as time went on, he realized he wasn't as good at the sport as he thought he was, so he dove headfirst into another love, music. That's when his friendship with Jerry Rafferty really began to take off. The two friends found themselves playing in bands like the Mavericks and the Censors as part of a buzzing local music scene in Paisley. Childhood aspirations were quite different for Jerry, though. Jerry Rafferty couldn't recall a time when he wasn't completely obsessed with music was always at the center of his world. After leaving St. Marion's Academy in 63, uh, Jerry took a string of day jobs, you know, just to make a little coin so he could pursue music. He was a butcher, uh, he was a shoe store salesman, and he even landed a job as a civil service clerk, knowing full well that he never intended to do anything else but uh, go after music. While Jerry juggled his various day jobs, he reserved evenings for performing with his buddy Joe. The first band they formed was named The Mavericks. It was a cover band that played the popular song from The Stones and The Beatles. It was a very humble start for the partnership of Rafferty and Egan, but it laid groundwork for what would come next. Jerry came up with a band named Steeler's Will 
but he also conceived the lyrics for Stuck in the Middle with You while Joe composed the music. Jerry's lyrics tell a biting tale of being stuck in a crowded music industry cocktail party full of phoniness and just empty chatter. In Jerry's eyes, the room was populated by clowns to the left and jokers to the right. Record executives, media pundits, and hangers-on who thrived in the business but had little to do with the heart and soul of the actual music. Jerry took a clever approach in delivering this satire, performing the vocal as a parody of Bob Dylan's signature singing style. Now, the vocal delivery, the subject matter, even the way the music flowed sounded so Dylan-esque, so much so that many listeners were fooled and mistakenly thought Stuck in the Middle with You was a new song by this legend, representing kind of a more modern style. I think that's so funny. Jerry's imitation was so sharp, so spot on, it really blurred the line between homage and mockery, creating a lasting mix-up in the minds of the fans. Now, Jerry stated that if he'd borrowed anything from Dylan, it was his phrasing. The way he delivered a line with the distinct, almost conversational rhythm. Jerry acknowledged he didn't shy away from uh, the similarities to Dylan. But the influence of one of his heroes was part of the fun while crafting Stuck in the Middle. It was a wink to those who noticed while still making the song entirely his own. Dude, it's so hard to keep the smile from my face. The agonizing cocktail party that's depicted in Stuck in the Middle with you, that wasn't the product of Jury's imagination. It was based on a real life event that he and Joe experienced firsthand. Now, shortly after signing a contract with American record giant a and Records, the label actually threw a party at a lavish launch party at the Chic Restaurant in the Chelsea area of Metro London. Jerry recalled this scene vividly. There was a massive table with 50 people, record executives and their wives, you know, musicians and their partners all crammed together as the liquor just flowed freely. The atmosphere was loud, it was boisterous, but in a very annoying way, from what he said, Jerry found himself stuck between two obnoxious label heads and their equally boorish spouses. So two days later, the memory of that uncomfortable night was still fresh in Jerry's mind. So he and Joe sat down and like 15 minutes, they turned their torment into riding stuck in the middle with you. The party may have been insufferable, but it gave Jerry and Joe a perfect inspiration for a sharp satirical pop anthem. They wrote it for a laugh, you know, just never expecting it to go anywhere. The recording is stuck in the middle with you for Steelers Will's eponymous debut album included the second assemblage of the band. Jerry performed on the acoustic guitar and he delivered the lead vocals. Joe delivered the backup vocal along with keyboards and rhythm guitar. I mean, there was a little bit of everything on this recording. Hand claps, electric slide tambourine, drum kit, bass, acoustic rhythm, and lead guitar. But the cherry on top was definitely that lovable, rustic, improvisational instrument known as the cowbell. <laughs> Steelers Will had the good fortune of having Stuck in the Middle with You and the rest of their debut LP produced by the incredible, legendary duo of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. Uh, the partnership, respected by decades of timeless music, simply referred to as Lieber and Stoller. Of course, Lieber and Stoller wrote some of the most beloved songs of the rock era, from Hound Dog in Kansas City to Yakety Yak to Jailhouse Rock. That's just to name a few. Stand By Me as well. I mean, lots. On Broadway with Cynthia Weil and uh, Barry Mann. Bring in the dog and put out the cat. Don't talk back. Jerry and Joe were starstruck by the presence of Lieber and Stoller. But they were taken aback by how humble they were and how pleasant they were to work with. No doubt it was a coup to have them producing that record. And Jerry and Joe, they certainly knew that. But what is a bit perplexing is that when Stuck in the Middle with You was finished and chosen as the lead single to introduce Steeler's Wheel to the world, neither Jerry nor Joe thought that the song had any chance of being a hit. They thought there was no chance in hell. Jerry was so indifferent about the song that he actually left the band to pursue a solo career, if you can believe that. By the time the song was released as a single in the spring of 73, Jerry Rafferty had split from Steeler's Wheel. Right 
As Stuck in the Middle with You was swiftly climbing the singles charts virtually everywhere, the label had a pretty big dilemma. Yeah, they had a hit single on their hands, but the lead singer was gone. So the band was no longer. What were they going to do now? There were live performances, videos, and other promotional appearances to consider in order to take full advantage of this song's accelerating success. Now, in Jerry's absence, Joe took over as frontman for Steeler's Will on their music video. He just lip synced Jerry's vocal parts. Isn't that crazy? He wasn't even there to sing his vocal parts. With the single racing up the chart and their album selling really well, the label eventually convinced Jerry to return to Steeler's Will. However, by the time that he came back, the band was unraveling. Everyone but Joe had walked, leaving the group like it started, with just Jerry and Joe. The old buddies carried the torch for Steeler's Will with a rotating crew of musicians to fill in the gaps. Later in 1973, the track Everyone's Agreed That Everything Will Turn Out Fine was released as a single, with modest results. Steeler's Will rebounded a bit in 74 with the release of Star, a great song written by Joe, about the fleeting nature of fame. So they made you a star. Now your head's in a cloud. That song peaked at number 25 in the UK, and then it made it to number 29 in the Billboard Hot 100 here. And it was uh, a solid hit on the AC format. and went to number six, though contemporary. Uh, the song actually established enough momentum to generate renewed interest in the future of Steelers Will. What will you do when you find yourself back on the shelf? The tension uh, simmering beneath the surface of Steelers Will, even between Jerry and Joe, uh, was that their partnership, once their driving force behind their music, had become too strained to sustain. After only two albums, the cracks were impossible to ignore. When Lieber and Stoller, the producers that guided that early success, parted ways with the man, that was a heavy blow. By the time he returned, Jerry wasn't fully committed. His heart was no longer in Steeler's will. It didn't take him long to make up his mind. With one final adios to Joe, Jerry split from Steeler's will and focused completely on going solo for good. Both men moved on, just taking different paths. In 1979, Joe Egan ventured out on his own with the dropping of his first solo LP, Out of Nowhere. The record yielded a little trash with the single Back on the Road again, but it was what they would call a turntable hit at best, and it didn't chart. Back on the road in the day. Two years later, in 81, Joe put out his second solo offering titled Map. Nothing happened with that either. Joe and Jerry rekindled their friendship in 1992 with Joe performing harmonies on Jerry's album On a Wing and a Prayer. Like the old days, Joe decided to leave the music business altogether in the mid-90s, quietly closing the chapter on his musical career. Now, Jerry's solo journey faced unbelievable roadblocks. We should do an episode on that one. Remarkably, he kept the faith and he stayed the course, outlasting all kinds of legal action against him. Jerry's opus, Baker Street, was born out of that turmoil that followed uh, you know, him breaking up with Steeler's will. Jerry reflected on that time with a sense of regret, particularly about the loss of the unique blend of harmony that he had with Joe. Their voice is so great together. He blamed the demise of the band squarely on the management and on the record label, not on the guys in the band. Constant legal battles forced them to stop recording, and for more than two years, Jerry shuffled back and forth between Glasgow and London, tangled up in meetings with lawyers and accountants trying to sort out all the mess. It was during the trips to London that Jerry would visit a friend who resided in a small flat just off Baker Street. After a few pints of Guinness, they'd head back to his friend's place, strumming guitars and playing music late into the night. And those quiet moments of escape nestled in the chaos became the inspiration for one of the greatest musical achievements of the 70s, Baker Street. Your way down to Baker Street. Jerry had went through hell to liberate himself from the legal hardships and to record his brilliant City to City album in 1978. City to City was a sweet triumph for Jerry, selling nearly 6 million units to date on the back of the success of Baker Street. And in the process, that saxophone solo set off a sax frenzy across the world as sales of saxophones went through the roof. Mm -hmm. 
Some people play the saxophone only because of Jerry. Jerry followed that up with the platinum record Night Owl, 1979, another great album. Snakes and Ladders followed 1980. It was a gold album. Both great albums. Sadly, Jerry struggled with his own demons that held him back from sustaining and expanding his stature after the achievement of City to City. Jerry had severe stage fright that led to his aversion for touring. The fact that he didn't tour really hurt the longevity of his career, especially in the States. He was just never comfortable in the spotlight and he hated to play that role. His most vicious demon though was alcoholism. Heavy drinking stunted his ascension after 1982, forcing him into obscurity for 10 years. It sadly ruined his marriage. Woman, right down the line. Stuck in the Middle with You came back in pop culture in 92, nearly 20 years after its initial release in kind of a bizarre way that Jerry and Joe would have never imagined. Jerry was already in disbelief that his parody, written mostly as a joke, struck gold selling over a million copies in the first place. But he was just as stunned when the song found a new audience thanks to director Quentin Tarantino. He used Stuck in the Middle with You in the savage ear slicing scene of his movie Reservoir Dogs. Tarantino shared with Rolling Stone how Stuck in the Middle with You became the perfect fit for the infamous scene. He said, and I quote, it was just one of those times when I knew the song would work really well. During auditions, Tarantino told the actors that they'd be doing the bloody scene and mentioned his plan to use the Steelers' Will song. But then he gave them freedom you know, to choose whatever song they wanted to use. Few of the actors selected a different song, but most of the cast wanted Stuck in the Middle with You, so they went ahead with this plan. Tarantino went on to say that the song just clicked. The first time they auditioned for the scene, the actor Michael Madsen's performance wasn't that great, but to the rebellious director, it was like the watching the movie unfold right in front of him. Tarantino remembered thinking, this is gonna be awesome. Tarantino got permission to use the song, even though Jerry and Joe weren't keen on violent movies. Uh, for years, Jerry kept hearing about the terrifying scene that the song was used in. Then he finally saw the movie, and while the violence was hard for him to watch, he had to say that from a cinematic standpoint, the placement worked incredibly well. He even said at one point that it was a perfect scene. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs> in 1973, Stuck in the Middle with You was a bona fide smash across the world. It went to number two in Canada, number four in Italy, number eight in Holland, number five in South Africa, number eight in the UK, number six in Belgium, and it went to number six here on the Billboard Hot 100. Jerry Rafferty died from liver failure in 2011. When he passed, Joe spoke to a reporter from the local newspaper, the Paisley Daily Express, where he fondly paid tribute to his old bandmate. He said, and I quote, he was supremely talented, something that had been obvious from the get-go. Probably his finest quality was the amazing sense of melody that he possessed. He had an ear for music, regardless of whether he was home alone or working with me in the studio, end of quote. And though their friendships had its ups and downs, Joe attributed their fallouts to the sheer amount of time that they spent together. Tapping into the lyrics of the beloved hit they wrote together in Steeler's Wheel, Joe contemplated why he and his longtime pal had so much conflict towards the last stages of the band's short duration. He said, we had our disagreements because we were so close. It was comforting that Joe and Jerry had revitalized their tight-knit relationship before Jerry passed away, they came back together. It was really healthy closure for the both of them. Joe actually died from a heart attack at a hotel in Australia on July 6th, 2024. He was 77 years old. Your know, life can be challenging. We've all put our heart and soul into something that just didn't materialize. I mean, one minute you're on the left, the next you're on the right. Sometimes you're stuck right smack dab in the middle, as the song says. But man, how sweet it is when something that you least expect becomes a wonderful surprise. And you know, it restores your faith in the old adage, you just never know. The only way to know with complete certainty that something is not going to happen is by doing nothing. Never creating, never taking any chances. 
Stuck in the Middle with You by Steeler's Wheel, written by the collaboration of two old friends, Joe Egan and Jerry Rafferty. Uh, it was one of the finest examples that when it comes to making music, you just never know where it will lead. Bob Dylan impersonation and all. <laughs> Leave us a comment about Steeler's Will. What a great song. What are your memories of this song? What do you think about Jerry Rafferty and Joe and their relationship? And, and really, Jerry Rafferty, I think he's one of the great underrated geniuses of rock and roll. We should do more on him. Let me know if you'd like to see that. Let's have a great discussion honoring these two great musicians. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.